Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we are recording a little early today as it is Halloween here in the U.S., possibly in other places as well. So we're doing a daytime recording and we have a great guest who is willing to come on early to talk to us, Ben Hale. He's both a fantasy author and he's got some nonfiction out. So we're gonna be talking about a little bit about his fantasy and then some, taking some questions from his book, Write Like a Boss, and uh, kind of discussing what it takes to go from hobby writer to full-time author. Uh, just a little bit about Ben. As I said, he's a fantasy and nonfiction author from Utah, where he's got six kids. He enjoys snowboarding. He's done volunteer work in Brazil and is fluent in three languages. So that means he's probably smarter than anybody else on this podcast right now. Uh, he's, he ran several successful businesses before publishing his first novel in 2012. His YA fantasy series, The Chronicles of Lumine. Ben, you'll uh, have to tell me how that is. <laughs> Luminea now spans five series, 18 titles, and has sold more than 150,000 copies. And uh, his nonfiction book is co-written with Honoré Corder, who you've probably heard on various podcasts around there. So Ben, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into writing and publishing? So I, I uh, was mentioning before, I never thought I would be a writer. This was not something that I thought was my career path. Actually, my English teachers in junior high and high school would probably panic if they thought that I was writing the whole time. Um, but sometimes, you know, an idea just sticks and it just kind of drives you, and that's kind of what happened with me. So I started writing about nine or ten years ago, and I wrote uh, three books uh, over the course of three years. Didn't tell a soul except my wife, and then I started editing and publishing and I spent three months of research before I published my first book because I wanted to give myself the best chance of, of success. Um, probably about 10 hours a week, just solid research. And by the end of six months, I'd sold 10,000 copies and sold my business and started writing full time. So, and now it's grown far bigger than I possibly could have imagined back then. That's awesome. It sounds like you got off to a great start right away. Was that just kind of from reading what people were doing on the various marketing sites or did it start out slow and then you figured out how to ramp things up? Uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, I, I planned a production schedule. I took a very business-like approach to my release schedule. So I did release three books in about seven months and planned uh, promotions and things in between those releases and at the time of those releases. And it just kind of um, grew and then kind of exploded when the third book came out. Um, it's amazing how much knowledge there is out there. And yet at the same time, how, how you have to plan what pieces of those knowledge are applicable to you. Because you can't do everything. You just can't, you don't have enough time. And the most effective thing you can do is keep writing. And so you have to really be smart with your marketing plan. Yeah, that's absolutely true. We were just, uh, the reason we didn't have a show last week is because we're at a place and one of the things they talked about was you have to triage, uh, otherwise you'll just get lost. But, um, all right, so a lot of people make the shift to, to writing and genre writing because they need an escape from their day job and other people find that their writing has similarities to their day job. So do you find that uh, uh, sort of your past life, your past professional life leaks into your writing at all? Um, my video game experience does. Um, I really enjoy playing video games. Uh, actually with my wife, uh, we prefer co-op games. And there's just something marriage building about having your wife lay down cover fire while you flank from the side. I mean, that just reinforces a relationship. And so yeah, I do draw on some of those things. Uh, but fantasy is just something I enjoy. I like uh, just the concepts of magic and how they pertain uh, to real life and how the situation, even with magic or no magic, it just, I don't know, it just makes it more fun. I've always liked that. And so being able to write it and invent and create things uh, is tremendous fun. Yeah, that's one of the nice things about like, playing video video games inspired my first couple of books too. And it's, it's amazing how um, you can sort of, 
it trains you to think in a certain way, but also it exposes you to what maybe is wrong with the genre. And half of the fun of writing your first book is fixing the problems of the last book you read or the last thing you played. Yes, yes, no question. Um, my current series from this year, uh, I was writing a normal training sequence of a character who has a lot of magic. And I, when I went back and did the second draft, I was very frustrated with this section. I ended up throwing out 8,000 words because it was just normal. It was just like, this is just like a normal training sequence. And what I replaced it with was a Requiem, which was basically like an enchanted machine that you step into and you get to fight in the memories of past soldiers. And so you can fight in any war, in any battle, and replay it and learn and become like a master in battle with, with any type of magic that you possess, which I just thought was so cool, like a combination of magic and virtual reality, trying to trying to fix that idea of like, oh, this is just a traditional training montage kind of thing. Before I get into my question, I, I do have a one side question here. You mentioned, and I love the fact that you enjoy playing games with your wife. Does it always go smoothly, or does the wife threaten you with divorce if you don't go a certain direction or do a certain thing? Because my <laughs> wife and I, we each we each enjoy playing in the video games there, but there are times where her sense of direction is better than mine, and oh, like we're flipping out the phone book, looking up the lawyers, but just kind of curious if yours goes as well as ours does. Our, ours goes really well, but we don't ever play against each other, so there's never any fighting. It's all co-op. But that, that, that's my point. If she's, say, for instance, trying to help you, and you're not doing what she thinks you should be doing, <laughs> so does it? You know, do you guys go like that? You know, I'm just kind of wondering. I don't think we ever have. I mean, there's been moments of like really a lot of tension, but we just because that's what the game inspires. But it's just, it just we start laughing and we both die, and then we, you know, reload <laughs> or start over, go back to a restore point, or it's just fun. I mean, it's. Marriage building. <laughs> <laughs> True test of a good marriage, if you can do that and actually survive with that. But Okay, my yes. question. Your blurb mentions that you're fluent in three languages. So the question as a, an author is, have you ever thought about translating your own books into one of those other languages, provided you haven't already done so? So I haven't. Um, and the challenge is, is that fluent is one thing, but uh, there's a level that goes beyond fluency that um, I don't have. And... I don't have a word for it. I've never discovered a word for it, but it's basically you know enough to translate something from a high level to a high level. So I wouldn't be able to do that at a high level, which means I keep reusing the same words and the it would lose a lot because I wouldn't know all of the specific um, how to translate this one word to this one word, and it would just take a lot of time. And so it would be better to pay someone who has that level of, of understanding of the language. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much my answer whenever when someone says, okay, you speak Spanish, why don't you just translate your own works into Spanish? I'm like, it's not that easy. I know like one word for car. I don't know like you know, all the five, six different ways to describe a car like you would in the English language there. But. Yeah, it would take my book and make it so that it, it would go down several grade levels in, in the language setting, and I'd rather not do that. Suddenly your YA fantasy is kindergarten fantasy. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Look, spot runs. <laughs> At the Dragon. So since you published your first novel in 2012 now, I guess it's been about five years, have you found that it was easier then? There's more competition now? Or are you able to keep things trending upward? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think it's kind of a catch-22 because in 2012, it was kind of the inception of this e-publishing revolution and you know all the tools. Um, and so at the time, yes, it was easier. Any, anyone that you meet that published then, they probably had a little bit more of a benefit. Um, it was easier to get their word out. It was easier to connect with an audience. Uh, just because there was so few books, the competition was less. On the same token, they didn't have some of the tools that they have now. Uh, things like Kindle Unlimited, which for me is enormous. Um, they didn't have those kinds of tools back then. Uh, the ability to publish through uh, auto or uh, ACX and Audible and things like that. That some of these facets weren't there then. So yes, it was easier, but at the same token, there was a lot that just didn't exist yet. Right. We we've we kind of joke with people that like when we got started, I was December two thousand ten, and I think these guys were even before me. That you couldn't buy sponsorships anywhere. There was one place. There was Kindle Nation Daily, and you could also do good Goodreads. 
set up a like pay-per-click campaign and, and that was about it and you couldn't find cover designers <laughs> but if you got out there and, and maybe made a book one free or something you could get a lot of people just hunting in the store looking for stuff yeah yeah so it's there was certain benefits but also certain you know detractions to publishing at that time and um, I'm glad I did when I did because it did set the tone for myself uh, but when authors I, I meet some authors that complain now about the the state of the market and and say that it's really saturated and that's really a challenge and yes it is but on the same token there's a lot more that you can do that you couldn't do then yeah that's definitely true and it sounds like you're a, fr a fan right now of, of kindle unlimited have you tried both ways wide and in kdp select and and what were your thoughts if you did i did i i took one of my series when i published my third series i took my first series and went wide release uh, made the first one perma free and did let it sit there for a year. And it did okay. I think I averaged about $50 to $100 a month across all platforms outside of Amazon. Um, it was okay, but for me and my content, it just didn't, it didn't really connect with any of those specific audiences. And when uh, they announced the Kindle Unlimited, uh, I was like, this is really gonna work for me because all of my five of my series are interconnected. Uh, at some point, one is a legacy of another uh, some have character crossovers, and that's made it really, really good for Kindle Unlimited readers because they read one and then jump to another and then jump to another, and it really threads together into one big, big overall world. Uh, so it works for me. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, but yeah, if you, for anyone that writes a series, and especially a bigger series, Kindle Unlimited is probably something to consider. Yeah. Uh, um... Well, speaking of series, you uh, you said that you did a tremendous amount of research before you started writing, and you, you ended up uh, releasing three books in reasonably rapid succession. Um, did you do like did, did you research and then do your writing and and base basic your writing on what your research determined would sell well, or did you have this sort of simmering in your head first? I wrote first, and then I went to market. Now, there's something to be said to write to a market where you figure out what you want to do to target a market and then write to that. Um, but there's also something we said, which is to write your passion. And that's where I was. I was writing something I was really excited about, a story in a world that I was really excited about. And when I got to the end, I said, I hope someone will be interested in it. Let's see where I, if there's a market that exists for it. Um, and apparently there was. So it did work out well, but in the research that I was doing, I was trying to figure out not just what market, um, but everything from keywords to free promotions, discount promotions, um, the effectiveness of uh, book covers and things like that, and just how to really build your initial brand um, on a very low budget. <laughs> yeah, I think that's definitely the way to go. We, we you know, uh, right to market is undeniably effective, but a lot of people misunderstand that as meaning that you should chase a niche instead of trying to find what niche you already fit in. Uh, so I'm glad to, to hear that your book was created and then the research was about how to, how to lead people to it because it, you can really get into the weeds otherwise. Well, the thing about that's awesome about writing is that uh, writing is a medium to convey emotion and ideas. And when someone is passionate, that comes across in their writing. And it can be very strong and very powerful. And if you're just writing to market and just trying to connect with an audience, then you lose a certain amount, or at least you can, if it's not something you're passionate about. So ideally, you want this excellent convergence of the two, where you're passionate and you're connecting with your audience. So when it comes to writing multiple books in a series, do you believe it's best to hold off publishing until you have two or three titles in that series, or do you feel you should just publish as you finish? So this, this brings up a really really interesting dynamic because uh, on the one side, preparing and publishing three books and so that you prepare three or four or two or whatever it's gonna be and then publishing them together does increase your visibility. On the flip side, it's that can also detract because if you do that, you're not learning some of the things you will learn with your first book out. And so you might make the same mistakes across your entire series. And so that's a difficult thing to do. Um, if you have the time or you're working with a book coach or a publishing coach that's gonna be able to walk you through the steps and can help you overcome and mitigate those uh, concerns, 
you then yeah there is some major benefits for uh, being on a publication schedule that enhances the natural ability of your book uh, if you publish once a year for three years your audience will, might be phenomenal and enjoy it but more than likely your audience is going to move on to someone else's content and then you have to recapture them back to your books I, I've heard multiple people say that an ideal public publication schedule is between three and six months um, depending on genre, length of book, and a bunch of other factors. When I publish, I do try to stick to about a three to four month publication schedule. And I'll publish in June, July, and then in the fall, and then in December, and then I won't publish for six months as I prepare that next year's books. We've had folks on that say that Young, young adult is a bit of a struggle just because that audience doesn't have credit cards and uh, you know there's a lot of studies that say they prefer paperbacks to e-readers. Uh, I know a lot of adults read YA but have you had any challenges in marketing your books to the teenage readers? This is one of my favorite questions and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, when people ask about how to connect with a YA audience um, and I'm going to compare this to uh, Harry Potter and Percy Jackson both billed as, as YA, even children's books. Um, so why did Harry Potter connect with such a wide audience, whereas Percy Jackson really hasn't? Um, Harry Potter is, is very well written, and even though it's all one point of view, essentially, uh, there's other characters that connect with adults. There's uh, like Professor McGonagall and, and Hagrid, and uh, there's these adult characters, even Professor Dumbledore, um, that connect with adults and so adults love the book series not just for Harry but also the themes that that resonate with people from various different backgrounds and ages and everything uh, on the flip side Percy Jackson the adult characters are very underdeveloped um, they're two-dimensional they're kind of just there to to give away information and then they're gone and it's principally driven by the young adult characters and what that means is the audience is principally young adults uh, that does make it harder. So if you want to connect with adults and market to adults, then layering your writing so that you've got a layer for adults, a layer for youth, a layer for grandparents, just by creating the characters and making them real and three-dimensional will make your book stretch beyond its intended audience and resonate with people from all over the place. Uh, that's a very thoughtful answer. I, I like that. I don't think I've heard anybody suggest it, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, not like the Charlie Brown thing where the adults are just like, wah, 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 wah. Exactly. <laughs> they don't even get dialogue in those. Exactly. Yeah, if you, if you bring in your three-dimensional, your adult characters that aren't necessarily part of the story, but bring them in and make them complex, make them resonate, then adults pick up on them. I mean, a perfect example is, uh, what's her name? She's in book. Um, six in Harry Potter, she's the teacher that comes in and she's really nasty but pretends to be nice. Umbridge? Umbridge, thank you. Thank you. She, geek, is, yep. <laughs> she is awful, but adults connect because they have had teachers like that. And she's, she's real and terrible, but adults remember teachers that were like that. They remember friends in college or high school that were like that. And so adults connect just as much as the kid readers do. When it comes to placing your books in categories on Amazon, and well, I guess on Amazon, since you're mostly in KU right now, you know, you kind of have the option to go teen, children, juvenile, teen, fantasy, and I noticed yours is, it looks like it's an adult, but the coming of age category. Have you played around and kind of seen what works best for you? Um, the advantage that I have is that all five of my series have a particular leaning, and that allows me to have each one be in a slightly different fantasy setting. So one of my series, um, The White Mage Saga, is on a 15-year-old teenage girl. She's the protagonist. In the same book series, I have an active duty Navy SEAL. I have basically the equivalent of a Navy SEAL except with magic, um, which is pretty awesome. And I have a guy that can turn into a phoenix that's lived for thousands of years. That's a huge variation, but it's billed as YA even though most of my readers in there are adults. And then I have another series that's based on rock trolls as if they were trained like Spartans, and they're called The Flesh of War. And in that context, it's all about the action and the combat, and that's not YA, 
But if a reader finds my series there, they can backtrack and follow the same threads to find my other books. So I do have that advantage. Not everyone does, but that is one of the facets that is, is fun to my series, is that I can market each series to a different or a slightly different audience. Now, you talked about a little bit earlier about how like uh, you didn't write to market and also how there's danger in releasing too rapidly early on because you don't have the opportunity to learn from your earlier releases. Having Once you've released those first few books, do you let the relative success or popularity of certain aspects make decisions about what you'll be writing in the future, or do you still sort of write what you want to write and then find a way to make it appeal? Um, I, I target things. Um, one thing I tell authors when I talk to them is be intentional in what you write. So if you are planning a, let's say a 20 book massive world across six different series, six trilogies we'll say, if you get to the end of one and it's very open-ended where they could go at that point, um, the challenge with that is then some readers want one and some readers want another and if you write one then you lose the other and vice versa. But if you get to the end of one and you imply or direct or reveal an aspect that directs your readership into a certain direction, then you're going to retain more of that readership. And frankly, it makes a more plausible and enjoyable story because then your readers are, are really excited, they're engaged, and then it's almost linear. They can continue to follow it to another set in your big 18 books, six trilogy world. Yeah, that's something that uh, I determined. That I, I have to agree. I've seen a lot, rather, in a lot of other people's writing where clearly this arc is intended to be a self-contained arc, but even within that, even at the end of that arc, they'll do like a sequel hook, is, is what I've heard recall, where just so you're aware, yes, there will be more, and here is the thread that you might be interested in. Yes. Doing that allows the reader to both feel and think of where it's going to go next and get excited. Um, the end of a book, that hook is a hook for your next series. And you don't want to just leave it open-ended and just say, oh, you know, I'll keep writing. I hope you enjoy it. You, you want to guide them. You want to lead them. And that's what's awesome about books in general is that you're leading your reader through this amazing and complex and nuanced story. Don't just end it, right, because the book ends. It can continue to grow. Unless you're really ready to be done, let it continue to connect and, and flourish. All right, so you've published numbers of titles, a, a bunch of different series. You're doing fairly well at it. And your bio says you've run you know, successful businesses. So I have to ask, which is more difficult, the business, the successful businesses part or writing full time? Oh, no, I've never gotten that question before. Um, I, I would say I would say writing full time is harder. Um, and the reason that it's harder is because when I ran my other businesses, um, one, I sold for six figures. I'd run that for four or five years and then other projects that did varying stages of su successfulness. Um, I was always involved with other people. And in that context, it was there were uh, expectations of what I would accomplish or what I would do. And that, in a certain way, it made it easier because even though they were challenging in their own right, people expected of me and so it was almost laid out for me what I needed to do. Even though I created a lot of it, I, it was still laid out for me. Writing full time is a whole different beast because if I skip a day, then there's no consequence for six or eight months or even a year. And even then the consequence is small. And so it's, it requires this, this devotion and this self-discipline to push yourself beyond what you think you're capable of. Um, my first year writing full time, I set a goal to write 2000 words a day and I did not hit it. And it was really, really hard. Uh, I mean, it's really, really hard. Um, and the next year, my goal is 2,500 words a day, and I still didn't hit it. And this is my fifth year, and my goal is 4,500 words a day, and I regularly hit it. But it's, sure. it requires this, um, this drive that has to come from within because no one is there telling you, go and write. You have to do this today, and if you don't do it, then you're not accomplishing what has to be done. So not only do you set your goals for yourself, but you have to do it yourself. And that is a whole different level of difficulty. For me, it's just keeping my sorry tail off the internet when I'm writing that way. And apparently, I'm easily distracted. <laughs> so. Aren't we all, Jeff? Aren't we all? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've mentioned before on this show, I think that I've, uh, I used to work a lot less when I was just self-employed doing stuff I wasn't as passionate about. Now it's really easy. It's like you have to, I have to make myself like, okay, it's 10 o'clock. I should probably not still be working on things now. And, and that's, you, you have to strike that difficult balance also because you can't get too involved in it. So um, I, I have six children. My oldest is 10 years old. My youngest is six months. I'm also in a master's degree and my wife is also in a master's degree. So there is so much going on in my life right now that if I don't manage my time very, very well, I would, I would get away from me and it would be over. I would lose the year would get, would be gone and I can't afford that. And so every single day I sit down, I know exactly what I have to do and I just go for it. And it's really, really hard sometimes, but the best attribute you can gain as a writer is to write every day. Everything else can come, but that single ability will stand the test of time. It will turn you into a professional. You'll learn, you'll grow, your, your books will become better just because you're practicing every single day. It's the hardest and yet most important attribute that a professional author gains. Right, and you must uh, be really good at managing your time <laughs> it sounds like you've got quite a busy life there. Do you work from home too, or do you I do, off to yeah. a coffee shop um, or something? For the first three years of writing full time, I had a corner of our master bedroom. Our house wasn't big enough for me to have an office, and so it was this little four foot by four foot space. And my kids would come in and climb on my lap and say, Daddy hug, Daddy hug. That's hard to say no to. <laughs> That's really, really hard to say no to. So managing those distractions and staying focused is absolutely essential. And for anyone that's listening that is thinking, man, I have so many distractions. I've been there, I know, and I'm still attempting to conquer, but I, I'm getting better than I was five years ago, which is what matters. Awesome. And uh, since your book has a lot of tips for writers, why don't we kind of shift into what made you decide to start publishing some nonfiction? So I, I've toyed with the idea of doing this mostly because people keep asking me questions and I enjoy answering them. I still do ongoing research. Um, so I feel like I have learned a great deal. And so I do enjoy sharing that knowledge and that information. And I've toyed with the idea for a while, but I didn't really feel like I had the right audience and it wasn't really the right time. I met Honoré at an event about a year and a half ago. Uh, there was 150 people at this event and I didn't know a single one of them except the per person that invited me. So I knew one. And I ended up memorizing all 150 names in two days. And he called me up and I named everyone in the room on the second day. And Honoré and I became friends after that. And we talked a lot about writing and publishing. And earlier this year in the spring, we decided, hey, let's, uh, let's write something like this together. And this has been the product. So Write Like a Boss came out um, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, and it, goes through how to develop a, some daily discipline, how to um, convert yourself from writing from a hobby into a business mindset, which like I've said is, is difficult and it's a challenge to develop that mindset. Definitely, it, it's so many of us come from the mindset that we're artists, you know, we're creative people and we're, we're not business people that it's hard to start thinking of your books like products that you now have to wrap up in attractive packaging and figure out how you're going to sell and, and then how you're going to structure your business and do your taxes and all that, like an actual professional business person. Yeah, and that's, that's really hard, um, especially if it's not something that's your background. But once you gain it, it's almost like creating a second personality where one personality is the employer, the writer, or, or yeah, the employee, the writer, and then the second personality is the employer, and they're the business person that say, no, you have to work late tonight because you didn't hit your word count. And it's a really weird thought process where it's all you, but you can feel those two aspects within your mind. And each one has sometimes conflicting goals. Uh, where the one wants to focus on the art and the other one wants to focus on um, on content and development and production schedules and the very specific things that's going to build your business. And so you have to strike that balance and you have to create that entire perspective. Uh, especially at, the more you write, the more important that aspect becomes. You mentioned, in, in, I think it's just in the blurb for your book, that uh, it kind of takes more than talent for most of us, that you do have to learn how to treat it as a business. Can you expand on some of the things maybe you've done, 
you know, it sounds like you are, you were already doing research before you launched your first book, but what, what are some of the things we can do to, to really develop that business mindset? Um, the first one is a daily discipline. And I already mentioned that one. So I'll just touch on that and reiterate that. Um, in, in the book, I talk about, uh, the courage, um, the courage of writing and that for us to write, it requires, um, a courage to push ourselves. Um, in the business sphere, if you, if you specifically speaking, you, you have to learn to set goals, um, manageable goals, but goals that you can go after and achieve. And it doesn't matter where, where you are. Uh, if, if you're doing a hundred words a day or 10,000 words a day, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that you create the ability to identify and set goals that you can go after, succeed, and then set new goals. And this becomes a habit both in writing and in learning the business side. So if you don't know something, then you need to learn it. Uh, two years ago, I wanted to learn and set up an automation series for my subscriber list. I didn't know anything about it. So I allocated uh, two hours, uh, three times a week, and said, I'm gonna study how to do automation. I'm gonna work on this. It took me about two or three months to set up an automation series, to write them, uh, look at samples, set it all up. But I set a manageable goal, two hours, three times a week. Uh, this is what I want the result to be. And then once it's done, it's done. And I now know how to do it. But it comes back to that same ability to identify the goals you need, to set the goals that you need to accomplish, and then be able to accomplish them. Now, uh, I, it's fair to say that most people who get started writing uh, are doing it because they've got some level of natural writing skill, which they can then develop. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't all necessarily have a, a level of natural business skill. Do you think that every single one, every single author can develop a business mindset? I don't doubt that for a second. Um, and I'm going to compare this to when my wife and I first got married, uh, we decided that we wanted uh, to learn to love what the other person loved. We'd seen couples that would do things apart, and there's nothing wrong with that, uh, where one would go golfing every Saturday, and then the, the wife would watch romantic comedies with her girlfriends on a Thursday night, for example. And my wife and I decided we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to spend time apart. We didn't want to have hobbies apart. So we decided to learn to love what the other person loved. And so since that time, I've learned to enjoy everything from romantic comedies to sewing to scrapbooking. Um, big, huge variety of things, decorating. And she's learned to enjoy snowboarding, video games, and kung fu movies, although she's not quite there on the kung fu movies. And so that's really where the video games came in that we talked about earlier. Is It started out as an idea of me sharing something I really enjoyed, and then she learned to enjoy it as well. And now we still do it. You can learn to enjoy and learn to do things that you do not think are within your realm of ability. And that simple acceptance that you can learn to do is, is enormous. Once you accept it, then you can say, okay, I don't enjoy it or I'm not good at it. That's okay, but you can learn it. Now, um, obviously learning to do anything or even just exercising your, your skills in anything takes time. And for somebody who has limited amount of time and would prefer to be spending what little time they have writing, do you think there's ever a situation where you're better off served, like finding a, a partner who's better with the business end of it? That's a, that's a hard one. Um, because if you do, if you do get a co-author, um, like any business venture, partners don't always work out. Uh, Sometimes it works out for a short period of time, and sometimes it lasts for longer, but partnerships don't always endure forever. And the challenge with writing and partners is that how do you separate a book that you've co-written? Uh, you might be able to do that with a business, but doing that with a book is really, really hard uh, doing that later in life. Now, generally, I say that it doesn't matter what you write or what genre you write. You need to learn at least the basics of the business side. Even if you go traditional publishing, uh, you still need to understand enough about contracts and the industry so that you don't get cheated, you don't get taken, um, you don't get undervalued, you know what to ask for, what to demand needs to be changed. It, regardless of what it is, understanding even the basics will help tremendously. And the, that's one of the cool things about this industry 
is that authors are so, for the most part, so ready to share, to talk, and to help um, build those knowledge bases on those who are earlier in their careers. And that's one thing that I just love is getting together and interacting with other authors. You can always find an author willing and ready to help you build your knowledge base. You mentioned before that uh, when it comes to like bit to trying to organize your time, I mean, you'll always just be writing something every single day. Do you find you work slash write best when following a set, ske set schedule, or do you just try and squeeze in writing time whenever you can? Um, I do work better with a set time, but that was did not come naturally. Uh, telling myself I'm going to write between nine and noon on a Tuesday, and then sitting down and looking at the screen and nothing's coming. The creative mind doesn't just jump when you say jump. The creative mind is like, nope, I don't want to jump right now. And you have to prod it and push it and say, okay, I really need you to work right now. And they're like, fine, okay, I guess I'll write. Um, and that goes back to writing every day. When you do write every day, that creative muscle gets stronger, more able. And then when you sit down, you get to the point that you can just create and create. And then you'll go away and come back and sit down and immediately start creating. Uh, it's still not easy but that ability exists. Uh, so no, it didn't come naturally, but yes, it is much better when you can because then it is like a job. And I go to work and I say, I have to write these many words. This is how many hours I'm gonna work at it. I'm gonna spend an hour doing business side of things. And so I block that time and then I focus as best I can during those times. I have a question from you from one of our YouTube viewers by the name of Sarah. Uh, she was saying uh, she wants to know, is wondering if he ever struggles with other people making demands and knowing when to say yes or no to things. Oh, now, Sarah, that is a great, great question. Um, the more you write, the more you do, the more people want um, either they want to know how you're doing it, they want to uh, get advice, uh, they want um, direction. Uh, sometimes they want you to collaborate with them and so opportunities inevitably open up and you have to be very intentional like what I said earlier you have to be very intentional on what you say yes to and what you say no to uh, and it goes back to your goals you always ask yourself does this yes or no line up with my goals if the answer is no you might want to consider skipping it if the answer is yes you might consider taking it uh, a few years ago, I got an email from someone who offered to buy my audio rights for my book series. And my initial response was, this guy's based in Canada. Is this legit? Um, it was in Canada, and it was legit. And so I considered my options of whether or not I should go ACX or should I go with this. And I decided I wanted to focus more on writing. And this company provided uh, fairly good terms, and so I chose to go with them. So far, I've earned over... A hundred and like forty thousand dollars for my audiobooks from one decision, but it was in line with my goals. So opportunities or questions or when people make those demands, question yourself, does this line up with my goals? All right. And also if anybody from Canada wants to produce your audiobooks, clearly it's a wise decision. So <laughs> yes. Yeah, Podium Publishing has done amazing. They're they're so good and they've done such a good job for me. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, it sounds like we found from a lot of guests that being prolific is sort of key for a lot of indie authors, especially if they're hoping to do this full time someday. Uh, you know, and especially for those of us who are in smaller niches where you're probably just not going to move 100,000 copies of an ebook, no matter uh, how good it is. Do you have any tips for really getting things done and producing quality books when uh, you are doing a lot of other things and have family to work around and such? Um. In, in my Write Like a Boss book, Honoré and I talk about um, a, a editing schedule, just as much as writing. There's just as much creation in editing as there is in writing. And so knowing your editing schedule, uh, how many drafts you do, what you do on each draft, uh, how many days it takes to do each draft, that sets it the stage for you to know an answer for yourself. This is how long it takes me to write a book. This is how long it takes me to edit a book. And again, it doesn't matter if it takes you a year or two months. You want to figure out where you work. I call it self-hacking. So you figure out how you operate for yourself. And then once you know it, uh, I call that, so that's finding your voice. And then you empower your voice. You look at areas that you can improve and do better at. Uh, you can look at yourself and say, you know what? I, I really don't do anything during this block of time. Maybe I should tweak it or change it. And so you empower your voice. And then the third step is you raise your voice. And so that's where you 
uh, take your writing voice and you just really push it and you're already connecting with an audience and that's when your audience just grows and swells because it is such a powerful voice that your 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 book conveys and uh, you mentioned before that you're shooting for like 4,500 words a day right now. Do you think that's good to have a, you know, most of us do look at that, like what's our daily word count goal? Is that something that's been helpful for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, knowing what I have to get done, I inevitably finish when I'm supposed to get off work. So it definitely helps to know what I'm targeting. And when it's four o'clock and I still have a thousand words to go, I really push that because I want to get off on time. And knowing what I have to accomplish in the day. Also, it kind of reduces the stress of feeling the weight of an entire book or a series down to a manageable bite one day. What can I do today? So when I sit down at work, I know what I'm doing and I just go to work and I get it done and really push that creative mind and then I get off work and I'm done. Now, goals can be day to day, but they can also be long term. Uh, how far ahead should people be planning uh, events in their writing business? So let, let's define that differently then. Let's say a vision and then goals. So a vision is your long term. What is your vision? It's difficult to make goals five years out. Um, I don't think I've ever set a goal for five years and ever hit it because my life changes and it goes a different direction. So your vision is your long term, what you're trying to go after and achieve and kind of that image. Um, your goals are the ones that build into that. So smart goals are ones that are like stepping stones so that you can say, I want to get to, my vision is here well, what are the pieces that are going to get me there? So your vision might be a five-year vision. When I started writing full-time, my, sorry, even when I first started writing, my, my vision was to take my wife on a date every month from my books. I wanted $100 a month. And I had stepping stones to get there. I know, high goals, right? And it, fortunately for me, I hit that mark in, in like two months. My five-year vision was to write full-time, and I hit that in six months. Um, then I had to change my vision. But the goals were didn't change. I knew what stepping stones I needed to do. I knew I wanted to release books at certain times. I knew I wanted to reach so many word counts. Uh, and knowing those stepping stones made it easier to align those goals into the vision. Yeah, when I started off, uh, I would always measure my success in what thing in my life I could now pay for with books. So it would start with like, oh, I can buy a 20 ounce of soda with what I just did. <laughs> and ended up with the house that I'm living in, but yeah. uh, so you say let's you know you have a five year vision as opposed to a five year plan. How often do you reassess and see if what you've decided or what you're aiming for is realistic? Um, so book writing is different than most jobs because you probably only get paid once a month or once a quarter or even twice a year, and so you're trying to think about you know how how often can you reassess because information is very slow. Um, I meet some authors that want to be national bestsellers in a year and that's an unrealistic vision just because it's difficult to achieve that so quickly. Book writing is a long game and so with a longer vision like five years or ten years uh, I find it's best to reassess once a year. It's also when I plan my year I block out my time as far as what books I want to write, how many days off I want to take in the year, uh, I assess my family situation, my school situation, uh, and I can make plans for the year. And then I set those goals, and then I go after them for a year. All right. So what are some of the most difficult obstacles you've overcome since becoming a full-time writer? Um, I, I mean, I guess the first one that I'd throw out there is doubt. Uh, doubt is, is, is so uh, commonplace. Um, I'm sure I'm like everyone else, at least I like to think I'm like everyone else, that I start to doubt myself all the time. Uh, sometimes it's small things, like my book sales decline a little bit, and I'm like, oh, what if they keep declining? Like that doubt just finds a way to like really thread its way in. Sometimes it's with bigger things that I'm re reading a book that I've read and I'm on draft 13 and I think it's crap because I've read it seven times. Um, and you doubt, why would anyone ever read this trash? Uh, but then you take, you have, overcoming that doubt is, it never gets easier. And so you just have to get used to it. You know it's coming and when it comes, you recognize it and push yourself past it. So I'd say doubt is probably the biggest thing since writing full time. I already talked about um, self-discipline of writing every day. So that's probably the two that I would say are most crucial. 
That's impressive. That's not, I, I was, I totally already envisioned what I thought you were going to say as soon as I asked the question. And I thought it was going to be based on what I've heard, organizing time to try and squeeze in writing time. Nowhere on the list. So I'm like, okay, you're going to get the salute there. Because especially you tell me you're on your own school, you've got all these kids. And I was like, damn. <laughs> and here I am complaining when my dog comes around the corner and wants to play for a bit. I'm like, okay, I, I'll shut up now. Well, and it's funny that you say that because if you'd asked that question four years ago, that probably would have been my answer. Um, but managing my time initially, that 2,000 words a day took me nine hours. Well, every year as I set my goals, I set goals that are slightly higher that push me, push myself and I drive myself to be better, to be better with time management. And so I'm five years in and I do 4,500 words in typically about five hours a day. And so I have time to do my master's degree and to do the business side. Um, but that didn't, I mean, that did not come initially. So now that is manageable, but that wasn't the way it was in the first year or the second or the third. It was really the third and fourth years that I was like, I'm starting to get, ha get a handle on this time thing. I'm getting off on time. I'm not having to work at late or on Saturdays to catch up on word counts. I'm, I'm hitting these goals. I'm, I'm developing that. So yeah, that answer would have been my answer a few years ago. <laughs> All right. So we talked about how product productivity and you know publishing for you in your case a book every three four months is is definitely a desirable thing, especially kind of in this fast paced, more competitive indie environment we're in right now. Do you have any suggestions for those authors who are doing that but still aren't? You know, maybe they've got like twenty books out, but they're still not managing to to sell that many books. So there's if your books aren't selling. Um, there's a few ways that you can look at it. Uh, and the, the good news is, is that it's a limited list. Uh, the bad news is, is that any item on the list is, isn't really fun to look at. Um, and I've done, gone through this process myself, so it doesn't matter how many books you've sold or what a series has done, you're, you're never not susceptible from these things on the list. And so uh, your covers is your first option. I've met authors that are diehard fans of their own covers and they're terrible covers. <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible covers. Um, and what you need to understand with covers is that your covers are not part of your book. They're part of your brand. They're part of your marketing. It is the packaging. It is not the product. And when you make that shift, you won't think, my book cover needs to personify the book. So taking a hard look at your covers, do they need to be updated? Do they need to be um, created by a professional uh, artist? Uh, it can get pricey and it's difficult to go through a rebranding. I'm actually getting ready to do a rebranding test on one of my series because it's done really well in audio and not as well in ebook. And so I want to try to make that work better. So your covers. The second is your book description um, or, or your reviews. I'm going to say just that whole content page. I've read book descriptions that had typos in the book description. Um, that's, that's not okay. But it's really hard if you know, you struggle writing book descriptions to just acknowledge that and then say, okay, I need some help and really learn and push yourself to learn those aspects. Um, the, and those reviews will probably reflect that. The third one is the most challenging and that is that you know how to write, but your voice isn't yet empowered. Um, there's a lot of writing things that improve uh, writing. I've been writing four years and I took a class in my master's class, master's program that I learned three or four things that immediately improved my writing. Um, not significantly, but if I'd learned them a few years ago, my writing would have been that much better a few years ago. And so taking a hard look at yourself, because the answer usually comes back to what you can do. Um, can you push yourself to learn? Can you write better? Can you write better book descriptions? Can you do better covers? Um, and you can't change the market. You can't change the genre. So if you want your books to do better, the answer, in my opinion, is rarely marketing. It's usually what can you do to improve um, what you have. Now, once the book is out there and those three elements are really strong, then it becomes a marketing question. What are the marketing techniques that will have the biggest impact? Yeah, it's a, it's a good answer. And it's really hard for us as authors to be objective about our own stuff. You know, we yes, think everything is. is either, well, we either think our writing is fabulous or we think it's crap. There doesn't seem to be any in between. So it's, it's tough being an author. <laughs> I would say too, also, you know, you have a great list. And then I've also seen people in that position that are jump, genre jumping a lot. 
you know, I think it sounds really good that you've made all your all your books kind of tie into the same YA fantasy series so that people, when they finish one, they are going to want to jump right next to the next one. So it definitely helps in my marketing. Um, and that's one of the awesome things about science fiction and fantasy is the sprawling series that are just awesome. They, it's so much fun for a reader to dive into this world and just follow it for so many stories and ideas and anything from magic to, you know, complex technology. It doesn't really matter what it is, but that's what, that's what the readers love is, is big stories and even bigger ideas and villains and it just keeps getting bigger. Absolutely. Now to switch back to talk about business, uh, the business and, uh, and the career, uh, it seems like there are probably uh, like business decisions and career decisions that are better left to later in a stage and, and some are better early. So do you think there are certain aspects of planning your, your, your author career that sort of you hold off until you've reached a certain earning threshold? Or are, are there things that you should be doing right from the start expecting success? Ooh, great question. Um, one thing to, to consider with, uh, early career versus late career is that there's certain marketing things that are more effective when you've got a bigger list. Um, so, but also some that need to be started early. So like a subscriber list, um, building that early gives it power in the later career and starting it late. It means that you don't have it until super late in the career. Uh, on the flip side, things like Facebook advertising or, um, doing free promotions, uh, giving away a free starter library, things like that. Those are some of the techniques that are really good if you've got a lot of books out because you can afford to give away um, a few books because the value of a reader is really high because get one reader and their chance of buying through your whole series or even a part of your series, um, that value of a reader could be anywhere from $8 to $20. Well, you can afford to spend $2 to get that reader because that's what the value of that return is. Yeah, it it, uh, it definitely seems like a lot of the time people either, like in my case, I did not plan adequately for success of my first promotion because I didn't have my mailing list in place. So if I had, I would probably have had a much better early career. Uh, and conversely, it seems like a lot of people assume that they will never succeed. So they never really plan for like the high-end business thinking. Well, that's a lot of the stuff we talked about last week is like, Probably you don't need to think about making yourself a C corp when you when you release your first book. No, but you, don't. you need to be aware when the time comes of like what options are available and what decisions need to be made. And it can be harrowing if you try to do those all up front. Yes, you don't need a two thousand dollar intricate website from the get go. It could just be a free blog. Um, you don't need to pay a lot. And the cool thing about continuously writing is that. Uh, once you have three or four books out, any marketing methods that you do is going to be magnified by how many books you have out. And so when I first started, I didn't even plan on marketing much for the first six months because I just wanted to get the books out and then start marketing them because then every marketing technique isn't marketing one, it's marketing your series, it's marketing you. And there's a whole lot more content then. <clears throat> All right. Um, so is there anything you'd recommend authors should start doing now in the hopes that someday they'll be able to start writing full time? So if you are part time and you want to become full time. Um, so I'm going to say this in the terms of if your vision is to be a full time author if, and if you're part time right now, start developing the same habits that you'll do when you're a full time author, uh, because then when you do make that transition, it'll be seamless. You'll already be doing all the same things that you would then. Uh, a daily word count, essential to a, to a full-time author. Even if it's 200 words instead of 2,000. It's the same habit. You're creating the habit. Um, marketing techniques, how many uh, hours a week do you devote to marketing? Uh, again, the volume doesn't matter. It is the habit that matters. So developing those habits, what's cool about doing that is let's say you develop those habits and you're doing 200 words a day. Well, six months in, you might be like, hey, this is really easy. I'm rocking 400 words. Well, then do 500 and then do 1,000. And your marketing, you might say, I'm going to spend three hours a week marketing. Lock that time out. Stick to it because that's what you'll have to do as a professional author is to use that exact same habit. 
And then when you reach that point and your books are tipping over that threshold and you're ready to go full time, the work won't change. Your habits will continue. Alrighty, and the final question I have for you is actually from one of our viewers uh, on the YouTube uh, chat there, uh, by the name of Lois. She wants to know. Uh, she noticed that you referenced something. Apparently, three things you learned in your master's class. She was wanting to know if you'd be willing to share those three things. Okay, sure. Um, so this particular master's class, one of the things I learned was end word focus. Um, I, I was grateful to realize this is something I kind of naturally gravitated to, but now I get to do it intentionally. So readers naturally focus on the end of sections. So like the end word right before a comma, before the period, before the, at the end of a paragraph, at the end of a chapter. Those things are, those words are the ones that are going to be retained in memory. So if you're finishing a paragraph on an it or like a preposition or on a really weak noun, then your whole paragraph suffers because of it. If you're finishing a sentence on a really strong verb, on a really strong noun, that's when it's it's much stronger. Uh, so yeah, an end word focus, that was one thing I'd never heard of before. And I realized I did it probably 60, 70% of the time, but once I was intentional, I do it above 95% of the time now. It's very focused. I want my strongest words at the end of a paragraph, and it just makes the paragraph come to life. It's just really, really strong. So that's one of the things. The other ones are like varying a sentence structure, um, which is surprisingly difficult to master, uh, to sentence structure and sentence length and things like that. So, but yeah, and word focus, that was one of the coolest ones I learned. I like that tip. And I think I'm like you where I probably do it a good chunk of the time, but you know, every now and then there's those ones that end with with or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, uh, and I mean, like, I didn't even realize it. Um, and I think the more you practice and the more you see your own work, you'll say, oh, that's not as strong, and you won't really know why. That's one of the reasons why. It's actually all 10 of the things that I've learned in my master's class are in the Write Like a Boss book, is it's 10 things to improve your writing. And the end word focus, I think, is number six, I think. Um, don't quote me on that, because I could be wrong. But it's on that list. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I was just going to ask you to kind of, if there's any final things you want to talk about, that was a good lead in to maybe people will check out the book now. And uh, why don't you tell us like your website and maybe if you have a fantasy novel, the first one they could check out and you're nonfiction too. So uh, you can find me on Amazon by searching Ben Hale. Um, that's my, my fantasy books. My uh, series name is Luminea or my website is luminea.com. Um, L-U-M-I-N-E-I-A. I'll spell it because otherwise I don't know who will be able to spell it. Um, and I think the thing that I want to stress is that anyone can write. Um, wherever you start, you can have the courage to push yourself to write more, to write better. Um, I'm at a point that I'm trying to push myself to write better, to write more, because it doesn't matter where you are, uh, full-time, part-time, writing one book a year, 10 books a year, it doesn't matter. Um, always push yourself as a person. And developing that attribute won't just help in your writing, it'll help you in, in your personal life, in, in everything you have going on, uh, becoming a better person, allowing the challenges of life to, to build you rather than to tear you down. Because we all face those challenges. Uh, we all face those struggles, and if we let them, they're gonna, they'll tear us down, and we can't let that happen. We're writers, we're creatives, we need to have that courage to, to push outward and inspire other people around us. That's the, the best part of being a writer is inspiring people. Um, I, th I think next week I'm going to pass the 200,000 books sold mark, uh, which is so much more than I ever thought was going to happen. And I've connected with readers from India and Australia and all over the world uh, that were inspired by my work. And there's no greater reward than inspiring another soul. Definitely true. Uh, when I mentioned before that I used to work a lot less, you know, I think that was part of it that I, I was writing like about home improvement stuff. And, you know, it's not like it's not useful, but I wasn't like going to give people this cool fantasy world that they could escape into and stuff. So it's, it is really yeah. great to be able to do this for a job. And um, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks Ben for joining us. And I will put the links to your, your books and your website 
Thank you. In the, in the show notes, my dog is shaking off, letting me know that the hour is up here. Uh, <laughs> and this is episode 155. If you want to stop by and get those links, guys, or um, I'll put a couple of the notes from the show in there. And we're on marketingsff.com. And if you are going to be listening in November, we'll be back to our usual times, uh, Tuesday nights, 6 p.m., on the Pacific Coast, 9 p.m. Eastern, if you want to stop by in the chat and listen live or just listen whenever it's convenient for you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. Thanks, Thank for, hey, thanks for hanging out with us, Ben. Nice to meet you. Thank you. So long, everybody. Guys, it's been a pleasure.